hello, welcome. Welcome to your astronomical reading. I have many knowledges of the planets and their influence on human life and human behavior. And I only have one question. Mm -hmm. Does this sound like you? You have a great need for other people to like and admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. Disciplined and self-controlled on the outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure on the inside. Some of your aspirations tend to be pretty unrealistic and security is one of your major goals in life. At some times you are extroverted, affable, social, while at other times you are wary and reserved. Does that sound like you? On a scale from zero to five, how accurate do you think that is? Gotcha, this is part of my psychological study. Cause that's a questionnaire that has been given to many people, mostly college students over the years, and they are asked to rate how accurate those statements are in relation to themselves, and most of them Rate them about 4.3 out of 5. In other words, very, very accurate. And this was done by a Professor Forer, uh, Bertram R. Forer, a psychologist. And when he did this, he told all of his students he was going to give them a personalized, individualized reading of their personalities. And almost everyone thought it was accurate, but they all got the exact same reading. So this goes on to prove what's now called the Forer Effect, a psychological tendency for us to take vague statements that are positive and apply them to our lives while ignoring the negative stuff. The Forer Effect can do a lot in the way of explaining why a belief in astrology lingers on for so many years, where we take vague generalizations about human behavior and no matter what they say, we apply them to our lives when Aries and Capricorn can basically say the same thing about somebody and they both think it's accurate. This was your debrief. So it wasn't, now you're informed of the study and you can't sue me. And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and then I assign a random astrological sign to them and talk about it because the signs don't matter and they're not a thing. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this here science channel and hint. <laughs> But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to make a Witcher with science. It's one of my favorite video game series of all time, and we were trying to make a Geralt of Rivia for real. I suggested a number of genetic and physiological changes that could help Geralt walk the path, and you can watch the video back on YouTube if you haven't yet. Unfortunately, although I do read all your comments and stuff on the video, I was not able to get to them because here in the void we do take breaks, especially over the holidays, so I was not able to read and respond to them in real time. So again, for this episode, I will instead be taking more evergreen comments from across Because Science that didn't really fit anywhere else, and I will be looking at those and trying to answer them now. But still, make sure you're commenting on all those videos, because I read them, I see what you say about me. Our first comment comes from Dante Williams, who says, in space, no one can hear you scream. At what altitude does this muting effect take place exactly? Well, we went through in our episode about this, there are waves that could be interpreted as sound, even traveling through the vacuum of space, but what I think you mean is at what altitude would the human voice not really travel anymore? And I think doing some research of my own, this is about at where space begins, around the Kármán line, which is about 62 miles or 100 kilometers up off the Earth's surface. I was looking at some calculations that showed if you were about 100 kilometers up into the air and you were about 100 meters away, you probably wouldn't be able to hear someone screaming. So if you want to not hear someone scream, go up into space, basically. I guess that makes sense. In space, no one can hear you scream, so you kind of have to go up to the edge of space to not be able to hear anyone scream. And if you want to, like, commit space crimes, no one will hear them up there. Yeah, yeah, no, just a note. Commit all space crimes in space. Yeah, no one will hear anything. <laughs> okay, love you. Oh, sorry, I was just adjusting my bang. Is that a bang? Is that a bang if it's over there? Our next comment comes from military sign Bravo Mike, who says, Kyle, I have a question. Oh yeah? You mentioned that an asteroid or a planetoid's gravity can be increased by spinning it around. This is what happens in uh, the expanse. Does that mean that if Earth stops spinning in its axis, would we feel more and more reduced acceleration due to gravity of the Earth? 
No. So let me be more clear. What happens in the expanse is they create a spinning asteroid to make artificial gravity on that uh, large rock floating out in the asteroid belt series, but they are not increasing the gravity on the surface per se. So have you ever seen those uh, machines at carnivals that spin people around and you press yourself up against the edge and you are forced up against the edge and you feel something that's approximating weight? That's what's happening with these artificially spinning uh, large bodies in the asteroid belt, specifically in the expanse. So they hollow out some of the asteroid, then they spin it up, and people live on the inside surface, the inside hollowed out surface, to feel this centrifugal gravity. You do not feel it on the outside of the planet. If it was to slow down, slow all the way down, uh, say on Earth, you would still feel all of Earth's gravity. In fact, because the Earth is spinning and it acts to fling things off of the surface of the planet, if the Earth slowed all the way down to nothing, you'd probably feel even a little bit heavier. And if the Earth spun way too fast, you'd be flung out into space, but about 100 kilometers up, no one would hear you. Our next comment comes from Big Bows, who says, Hey Kyle, when you're talking about the little baby Yod, I'm surprised you didn't mention the immortal jellyfish, which can revert back to its infancy stage after reaching sexual maturity multiple times during its lifespan by trans differentiation. I guess it isn't a vertebrate, but it's still an interesting hypothesis as to why uh, baby Yod still looks like a baby at 50 years old. P.S. You should really watch The Mandalorian. I said I'd never watch The Mandalorian because I don't want to pay for an additional streaming service, not because I don't want to see it. I'd see it. I just don't care. I don't know about the mortal jellyfish for the wee baby yod, because then we'd have to posit that when one of these, whatever the species is, gets to a certain age, it then reverts back to a baby yod form and then just lives forever, where we see Yoda dying of old age for sure. So it kind of implies that there isn't this recapitulation of the baby yod state. But it is a fascinating creature. Although I will point out, immortal is in air quotes as they say, because, you know, there's probably not an immortal jellyfish alive today that has been alive forever. It's a jungle out there, and down there, and especially in space, where no one can hear you. The Ethereum says, wouldn't applying lots and lots of Gs on every single of your body at the same time equally be harmless? No. So a uh, differential application of uh, acceleration and deceleration would be bad, and like slamming a car's brakes and you're slowing down like that. Um, that would really be bad, but even if you apply this acceleration or deceleration to your whole body at the same time, say you were strapped into a rocket and you accelerate out into space where no one can hear you, that would still be bad because what you're effectively doing is increasing the particles of your body's weight. So even if they aren't being flung around by acceleration and deceleration, they would in effect get heavier. Now think what would happen to your circulatory system, for example, if your blood got too heavy, literally, to pump around and your heart had to work too hard and your blood started pooling in your feet and then you pass out and then you die. That kind of stuff happens to fighter pilots. So we know that even uniformly applying acceleration or deceleration can still be very dangerous. Don't do it. Tawan1984 says, does having blue copper blood have any advantage over red iron blood, i.e. moves more oxygen around? So I showed this video of an octopus pumping blue blood with one of its three hearts around one of its semi-intelligent tentacles. Whew. Now that is potentially problematic if you don't know what you're looking at. But <laughs> more importantly, copper blood does have an advantage over iron-based blood, and it's reflecting light differently, which is why it's a different coloration. But it doesn't necessarily have much to do with the oxygen or oxygen-carrying capacity. It has more to do with temperature. Copper-based blood is less affected by low temperature than iron-based blood. And these sea creatures, you probably don't realize this, but the ocean is really cold. Aside from the surface, which is probably the only place you've ever been in the ocean, aside from the surface, just go down a few dozen meters and it gets down to like freezing, like almost literally freezing temperatures. And so these animals have blood adaptations through evolution and natural selection that allow for that blood to move more easily throughout the body. One of those adaptations, one of a myriad, is copper-based blood. And that's why these giant Pacific octopuses, or octopodes, if you want to be really annoying about it, have that blood. Why those octopodes have that blood? Because it's cold down there. Our next comment comes from JS who says, would Ant-Man drown in a raindrop or a water drop? Yeah. Yeah, he would. If Ant-Man has like a portable source of oxygen, which you would have to have because you can't shrink oxygen down, he would need portable oxygen so he might be able to survive inside his suit. However, changing scales matters a lot. So something like an ant or an insect or say a mosquito or a fly, a drop of water 
can be a death sentence. And that's because at that scale, when you're that small, the forces that involve themselves in water, like cohesion, adhesion, the density, the viscosity of water become a lot more meaningful to you on that size. So at the size of an ant or an ant sized person, the surface tension and adhesion in the drop of water might prevent you from being able to escape that water drop. You can see this happening to insects where they will get stuck in a drop of water and drown. So at Ant-Man scale, these smaller forces become a lot more significant. And yes, Ant-Man could probably drown in a water drop, which is kind of a lame way to defeat him. But it's better than dying in a purple guy's butt. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Jesse King, uh, who says, uh, in relation to the Expanse episode where I said a spaceship can survive a small hull breach, um, and I didn't know whether or not you'd want to patch that before re-entry, Jesse says, at re-entry speeds, a cup-sized hole, or on almost any leading surface, would almost certainly destroy your ship. The hole basically turns into a plasma torch, funneling superheated gases into the ship's interior, which would rapidly increase the size of the hole, as well as compressing the internal structure of the ship. This is, alas, what happened to the shuttle Columbia due to a minor crack on the heat shield of one of its leading wing surfaces during re-entry. Thus, any ship that's gonna make a classic atmospheric braking re-entry maneuver absolutely needs to be ship shape before attempting it. Now, the Expanse engines have such powerful and efficient engines that they don't need to use atmospheric braking. They can make powered re-entry, which can be gentler and more forgiving as it doesn't hit the atmosphere at such enormous velocities. So, correction to what I said, I did say if you want to land, you definitely got to plug it, which I stand which I stand by, but if you are re-entering from space, the condition of your ship even just little imperfections, space is incredibly dangerous, can be very, very consequential, as unfortunately we saw happen to Columbia, which broke apart uh, upon re-entry and was a disaster and a tragedy. So, if you're in a gunfight in space where no one can hear you scream, you definitely want to patch up that ship before returning and make sure it's ship shape. And for pointing all of that out, Jesse King, you are indeed the king of this episode. Super nerd. Now, moving right along to this week's episode. This week's episode of Because Science Is, uh, how to survive a fall from any height. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are looking into the physics of free fall and exploring some of the creatures and physical properties that allow organisms to be immune to fall damage. Huh, just like a video game or something. But before we get into all that weirdness, please go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about The Witcher, and leave me your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. I know that I can't respond to every comment, but I do try to read all of them or nearly all of them, so make sure you're liking, commenting, subscribing so you can keep up to date with everything that we're trying to interact through. And don't forget, how's that resolution going? It's more of a lifestyle than a single choice. Keep it up. Put down the sode and watch that yode.